Okay, so we're going to continue on with our pathophysiology. Today is our respiratory day, so we're going to go over some of the key uh, pathophysiology and physiology of the lungs, also called the respiratory system, also referred to as pulmonary. Those are all terms that you'll hear to describe the respiratory system. And so what we want to do is think about all of the different structures that uh, play a part in our uh, ventilation, in oxygenation and so forth. So we have to start with where the air enters. Uh, that air which travels through the oral cavity and sinuses. Um, there's a particular purpose for that. What happens when air travels through our oral cavity and our sinuses? What happens in those structures? There is a warming process, there is a humidification process, and there is somewhat of a uh, straining process because as we breathe through certainly our nose there are little hairs and such which can trap pollutants or particles or think irritants and things such as that. So if we were to bypass our nose and our mouth as our airway and we put for the patient a tracheostomy which would be an artificial opening into the trachea for breathing what would we lose? What protections and what functions would we lose by putting the airway here? The filtering, the warming, and the humidification. And that's something that we need to think about if we're taking care of someone who has an artificial airway. Those functions, those protections will be lost. Okay, then when we breathe in air, it travels through the pharynx, um, epiglottis, larynx, and if any of those structures have swelling or abnormalities, the airway can be impaired. One of the ones that you learn in pediatrics is epiglottitis. The epiglottis is that flap that goes like a trap door. When you're breathing, right, you're open to your trachea, right? When you're swallow swallowing, you're open to your esophagus. And if that flap becomes inflamed, then it can be very difficult for someone to breathe. And that's very serious because you can lose your airway. And of course we know that airway is number one. So anytime that someone has swelling in their throat or in their neck, we worry about loss of the airway. Okay. All right, so let's talk about the main structures in the lung. Of course we have the trachea, you can feel that. If you were to put your fingers on your neck, you can feel those little cartilage rings. That's uh, something that you can feel. Um, when the trachea goes down, it bifurcates. It makes two branches, the right and the left bronchi. A lot of times when we intubate patients, because this pathway is more straight into the right lungs, many times the ET tube, the endotracheal tube, will end up in the right main. So after we intubate a patient in um, like ICU, we have to make sure that we listen for breath sounds on both sides because if we've uh, put the tube in too far and we're into the right main, they're only going to be breathing on one side. We'll only hear air movement on one side. That's also why after we intubate somebody, we always do a chest film to verify placement of the ET tube. Where the ET tube should be is just above the carina. The carina is the bifurcation of the right and left main stem. That's also where the cough reflex is when you suction someone. When you're putting down your suction tube, you're going to hit carina or bottom. And that's when the patient will do this <clears throat> pretty violently. And when you learn suctioning later today, you're going to learn, or now you're going to learn it next week. Or did you learn it already? Yeah. Oh, I'm so behind the scene here. When you hit bottom and the patient has that cough reflex, you need to pull the catheter back just a little bit, maybe one or two centimeters, before you start suctioning out the patient. Otherwise, you're just going to take out chunks of tissue uh, from the carina area, right? It'll be traumatic for them. So you put your tube in until you hit bottom, and you get that cough reflex. That's carina, or the bifurcation. When we intubate somebody, same thing. The ET tube should be at least one or two centimeters above the carina, right? So when you're taking care of patients that artificially are ventilated or just got intubated, like my patient Sunday, actually it wasn't my patient, it was a patient next door, but I was lucky I got to help with the intubation and assist the physician to do it. Once we get the tube in, we need to make sure there's breath sounds on both sides. Can you see anatomically that if you were putting a tube down, that it would be easier for it to go into the right main? You see that, how it's more straight? 
Okay, then of course we have all of the little bronchioles and, and down into the alveoli, which is the main <laughs> functional unit of the lung, and we're going to talk about that in a, in a second. Just as the nephron is the main functional unit of the kidney, the alveoli is the main functional unit of the lungs. Now these structures that we're looking at right now participate in the function of ventilation, meaning air moving in and out. There isn't any gas exchange that's occurring in the trachea, the right or left main bronchi, or the bronchioles. There's no function of gas exchange where O2 and CO2 are exchanging. That happens in the alveolus. What happens in the structures you're looking at right now is ventilation. And ventilation means air goes in and air comes out. So if I happen to have a large mucus plug right here, what's going to happen to ventilation down below that? It's not going to happen, okay? So what you're looking at right now, the main function is ventilation. They're merely tubes for air to move in and out. All right, now I've never been able to find the picture that I really wanted, so I had to draw one that <laughs> looks at the alveoli as the main functional unit of the lungs. So bear with me, it's not real you know, sophisticated, but it is the picture that I want to share with you as far as understanding the alveoli and what it does. All right, so this round structure right here is supposed to be the alveoli, and it's a single-celled structure, all right? And below that is the pulmonary arterial structure as far as bringing blood flow to the patient and then taking oxygenated blood back to the body. And again, these are single-celled uh, vessels so that it is very easy for gases to diffuse. All right. So in the alveolus is where gas exchange occurs. That's where respiration happens. Respiration is the switching of gases. It doesn't take any energy for this to happen at all. It is passive because in your alveolus, there is a higher concentration of oxygen than there is in your bloodstream. And in your bloodstream, there is a higher concentration of CO2 than there is inside of the alveolus. So by gradients, just because there's a higher concentration in one area than the other, you have passive gas exchange or respiration. That's where respiration happens. Not in all those, not in the trachea, not in the bronchioles. This is the functional unit of the lung where gas exchange takes place. So it's important for us to understand a few terms. And alveoli, of course, is the functional unit. The next term is ventilation. And if you see at the top of the diagram, ventilation is represented by a V. And you'll see this abbreviation used in relationship to tests and things that physicians are talking about with respiratory patients. Again, ventilation just means air's moving in and out. That's all that it means. If we're having trouble ventilating a patient, it means that we cannot push the air into them. If we have them intubated and the bag is really difficult to compress, we are having a trouble with ventilation, okay? The patient may be still doing just fine, and they may not. It just depends. Then we have this inspiration and expiration. That's physically what's happening with the patient. In order to inspire or breathe in, that takes some action on our part, right? We have to be able to expand our chest. When that happens, the diaphragm goes down. When the diaphragm goes down, it increases the space inside the lungs. As that space increases, the gradient of pressure goes down and air rushes in. Expiration, the act of air coming out, is passive and by recoil. As the lungs are filled and stretched out, then by recoil, the air automatically comes out. We don't have to hook up a vacuum to suck the air back out of people. We don't ever do that, all right? So inspiration requires effort. It requires good musculature. It requires, hopefully, a healthy diaphragm which will go down with inspiration so the lungs expand and air rushes in. Expiration is passive and just happens as those muscles that are stretched out relax. 
Aren't you glad you don't have to get up on top of your patient and push the air out of them every time after they breathe in? That would be annoying. That would be a, a difficult duty to have to do. All right, now, in order for this functional unit to be healthy, remember we have to have ventilation, air moving in and out, and we have to have perfusion, which means we have to have blood flow, which is present around each of the alveolus. And then remember the alveolus looks like a grape cluster, all of them together. And then if you look at pictures, it usually so shows vasculature around them. So don't ask me why, but someone in their infinite wisdom decided that they would represent perfusion with the letter Q. <laughs> I don't know why. They should have just made it P. And then it would have been logical to everyone. And then we'd be doing a VP scan on everybody instead of a VQ scan on everybody. But that's just not what they did. So that you understand, perfusion is represented with a Q. That has to do with blood flow. Do we have pulmonary artery blood flow to the alveolus? Do we have pulmonary venous flow back to the heart? Remember. The pulmonary artery is the only vessel in the body which carries the blue or deoxygenated blood, right? It's the only place where an artery carries blue blood. After respiration occurs, then the oxygenated blood ends up going to the left side of the heart to be perfused to the body. That's the way things are supposed to work. So in order to have good respiration, meaning gas exchange, we need ventilation, and we need perfusion. We need what's called match. And that's going to be on the next slide that we talk about. So diffusion happens pass passively. There's not any um, energy requirement or anything like that that's required for the movement of oxygen and CO2. <coughs> oh, it's not on the next slide. We'll get to it eventually. Other important components related to the respiratory system. Surfactant is present inside of our alveolus. It's like a slippery, gooey kind of stuff that keeps the alveolus open. If you have a premature baby, many times their surfactant is not well developed and their alveoli are clamped down like this. So sometimes they'll give them drugs or uh, medications to help the alveolus stay open. Some patients have diseases where they don't produce adequate surfactant or they smoke, which decreases surfactant production. And that causes the alveolus to do this. Slam down. Are you going to get any gas exchange? Or are you going to have any respiration occurring if the alveolus is slammed down? No. So we need to have plenty of surfactant and we need to have healthy habits, hopefully, so that that all stays intact. The mucociliary system, that has to do with those little hairs in your nose that trap things and the mucus production of goblet cells and so forth that help trap things so that if you inhale a lot of nastiness, it gets trapped, mucus forms around it, and then what do you do? <clears throat> and then you hack it out. You cough it out. That's all protective. Now some people have disease processes where they make too much mucus and they have hypertrophy of their mucus forming glands and they call that, what do they call that? It's like, well it could be cystic fibrosis, that's actually a little bit different patho, but I'm thinking of like chronic bronchitis. Okay, so that's a possibility. The cough reflex is very important. If the mucociliary system is trapping everything and getting it all cordoned off, we need a good cough reflex to cough it out. There's nothing more spooky than when you go to suction somebody and you put the suction catheter down, it hits carina, and nothing happens. You're like... <laughs> and the patient's not coughing. And you're like, oh no, oh no. If they don't have a cough reflex, what are they at risk for? Huge aspiration. And that is the issue with many of our patients that have had strokes. They lose their cough reflex. And a lot of times those patients will end up with a peg, a feeding tube, and a trach for the rest of their lives. I know I always try to point to the wrong side for a peg. I don't know why. But if we don't have a cough reflex, we're going to aspirate. The patient will either drool or be aspirating, and that's, that's very bad. So when you put that tube down to suction them, you expect Ugh! And if you're not getting that, and they're not doing anything, you either don't have your tube all the way down, could be, you have to put it in about this far to hit carina. 
If you only put it in this far, you haven't even gotten out of your tube yet. You're still in your trach or your, your uh, ET tube. You're going to have to put it in at least that far to get through the tube and down into the lungs, right? So I have some students, they want to put the tube in that far to suction. I'm like, you haven't even gotten out of the tube yet. You're not even out of the tube into the lungs yet. You've got to put it in pretty far. But if you're not getting that cough reflex, that's significant, and that's going to impact um, the patient's care. You're going to be at risk for lots of things. Okay, reflex bronchoconstriction. Some of you and some of your patients have what they call reactive airways, which means when you inhale certain triggers or certain substances, right away it causes bronchoconstriction. And wheezing. This is the main pathophysiology with asthma. Okay? Um, they try to call it bronchoconstriction or reactive airway before they label someone with a diagnosis of asthma. That can affect abilities to get insurance and other things. So again, if you have a child that's having reactive airway, they're going to call it that for a while before they label it with asthma. All right, alveolar macrophages, these are resident cells which are in your lungs to be phagocytic and try to protect you from bacterial invasion. So monocytes traveling around become macrophages and take up residence in several organs. These are the ones that take up residence in the lungs. Because, remember, our lungs are a way that we can become infected, right? Pathogens can use our lungs as a portal of entry for infection. So having resident immune cells can help protect us from invaders. All right, oxygenation. We know this is number one. You know it's a good answer on any test question, especially if you don't have any idea what the test question's asking you. Looking for an airway answer is always a good guess. Well, let's just talk about many of the factors that are necessary for healthy oxygenation in patients. First of all, we hope we have healthy lung tissue. Nice, spongy, elastic, uh, lungs with surfactant would be really nice. And I'm telling you the best analogy I can use for this is underwear. Underwear. If you take a brand new pair of underwear out of the package, they're nice. They're stretchy. They have elasticity and recoil. Things can happen inside of those underwear and they, they can withstand it, correct? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Okay, you get the idea. If you have a pair of old underwear, yes, they're more comfortable. <laughs> yes, they're probably the pair you're going to pull out when you don't want to have one of those lazy days, but they lose their elasticity. They could easily have holes in them, right? They might already have holes in them. Do you get the concept? See, for me, talking about underwear helps me understand lungs. So a healthy lung is, I know, I'm weird. <laughs> but that new pair of underwear is like a healthy lung. And an old, old pair of underwear is like an unhealthy lung. No elasticity, doesn't spring back, easy to get holes in it, difficult to deal with, difficult to uh, support oxygenation. All right, we need to make sure for healthy oxygenation that ventilation is intact, that we are able to move air in and out of that patient. If we have a lung tumor and it invades one of the uh, bronchioles, what do you think happens with our ability to get air in and out the lung tissue that's below the tumor? it becomes problematic. In fact, many times when we have a patient who has a lung tumor, they show up to us with a pneumonia in the area where the tumor is because ventilation is not occurring and that area fills with fluid. And then that fluid makes a, be a medium for bacterial growth. So a lot of times we find tumors, the patient will come in with pneumonia, we clear the pneumonia and guess what? There's something still there. We find the tumor. So. Ventilation is very, very important to have good oxygenation. If we can't get air moving in and out, we're, we're going to have problems. Our cell membranes in the alveolus need to be healthy and intact. Remember, they're single cell. What happens if you inhale a bunch of smoke? What's going to happen to those single cell structures in the alveoli? They're going to be swollen and inflamed, and they're going to weep, and the alveoli will fill with fluid. What happens with gas exchange then? Exactly. So we have a huge issue sometimes 
when the alveolus becomes damaged or filled with fluid. So it could be actual damage to the alveolus from smoke, or we could have a patient that has congestive heart failure and fluid volume overload. Do you see how easy it is for the fluid to push out of the blood vessel and into the lungs? It's only single cell. It's really easy if the pressure gets too high for that fluid to end up inside the lungs. If that occurs, are we going to have respiration or gas exchange? No, we're gonna have problems with that. All right. And pressure gradients intact. Uh, this has to do with the integrity of the lungs and the blood vessels. If we have a patient that has pulmonary fibrosis, the tissues in the lungs become fibrotic, they no longer are elastic, anything that becomes fibrotic or scarred loses function. So that will change the gradients of pressure. It will be much harder to get oxygen into those areas because the lung tissue is not pliable. The single cell diffusion things cannot happen well. All right, do we have a healthy nervous system? Is this patient neurologically intact? If a patient loses their neurological innervation to their diaphragm because of a stroke or because it's surgically accidentally clipped when they did coronary artery bypass surgery, which happens on some patients. Oops, oops, we hit the nerve. I think that would be the phrenic nerve, isn't it? The one that innervates the diaphragm. Oops, if they hit that and the diaphragm doesn't work well anymore, what's gonna to happen to ventilation, right? Ventilation is dependent on inspiration. Take a deep breath, diaphragm goes down, increase the space, and then all the air rushes in. What happens if the diaphragm motion is lost? Well, that would be bad. They're not gonna ventilate well. We gotta make sure we have enough blood. That's the perfusion part, the Q that should be a P. What if the patient has no blood? Are we going to have adequate oxygenation? No, because we have no cars to carry oxygen. It's a low traffic day, not too much cars. Nobody's around to carry oxygen. That looks nice, not much traffic, but on the other side, we're not getting any oxygen. Is anything going to get done? Is the patient going to be alert and oriented? And this is where we sometimes think the patient has a neurological problem, but it's because they're not oxygenating because they don't have enough blood. Their lungs can be perfect, but if they don't have any blood, they're gonna have a problem with oxygenation. Last but not least, let's remember we need a healthy heart. If the patient's just had an MI and their heart is not functioning well, it's not going to pump blood to the lungs well and they're not going to oxygenate well and they won't get oxygen to their tissues or their body. So many times we see a respiratory problem, it may or may not be so. It may be compensatory, it may be because of other issues. All right, this was the slide that I was referring to. Match or mismatch. And you need to understand this concept because the doctors use these terms. They describe the pathophysiology in the lungs often by using those terms of match or mismatch. So, which do you think is better, match or mismatch? Match, match. that's logical, isn't it? You want a good match, whether it's a relationship or whether it's ventilation to perfusion, you want a good match. Makes things happy and wonderful. Now the match, what we're referring to are the two partners. Ventilation, air moving in and out, and perfusion, the blood flow. Those are the two partners that we're referring to. If there's a problem with either one, you have a mismatch. You have a problem. The picture in the center, which I apologize is not very good, but the picture in the center is a normal, is a normal alveolar unit. You have adequate blood flow, arterial blue blood coming in, and oxygenated red blood going out via the pulmonary vein to the left side of the heart. And you have adequate ventilation occurring through the tubes in the lungs. You have adequate air coming in and out. This is normal. This is match. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. All right. A deviation in either one of the partners can cause mismatch. 
much so as in a relationship. If either one of the partners freaks out, there's a problem for both. Yes? Okay. Yes, you're all nodding your heads. Okay. So, in this example, you have a problem with what? With ventilation. This could be a hot dog. That could be a, v a plug of mucus. It could be a wheel from a hot wheel. It could be any, it could be a coin. It could be anything. It, it could be a cancerous tumor. If we have an interruption in ventilation, the air cannot get in and out of the circuit, even though there's plenty of perfusion, we have a mismatch. Okay? The other can also be true. We have plenty of ventilation here, but we don't have adequate perfusion. What would be a, a good example of this? We have an interruption in blood flow. It's a PE, pulmonary embolus. We have a little embolus right here that clogs the pulmonary artery, right? DVT, piece of it breaks off, lodges in a pulmonary artery. You're not going to have adequate perfusion to the circuit. Patient's going to have a mismatch. So doctors will use this to describe pathophysiology in the lungs. They use it most of the time to describe a pulmonary embolism. And the test that they do to determine if the patient's had a pulmonary em embolism is called a VQ scan, a ventilation perfusion scan. And what they do is they have the patient inhale isotopes. They inhale isotopes so that you can see the ventilation circuit lit up, that portion of the circuit lit up, and they infuse isotopes so that they can light up the perfusion part of the circuit so that they can study both partners and look for match. You follow? And the results come back saying there's either a low or high probability of pulmonary embolism. They are doing CT scans now that also give that information. But that's where the, that's where the letters come from, that's how it works. It's, you know, I just want you to understand that because you're going to hear that terminology all the time. All right, how do we assess a patient who has pulmonary respiratory type issues? Again, we start with the vital signs. If somebody's having problems, what do you expect we're gonna be looking at the most? We're gonna look at the respiratory rate. What do you think you would look at next? What compensates if the patient's not getting enough oxygen? The heart rate. So you look at the respiratory rate first, then you look at the heart rate. If the patient's hypoxic, meaning they're not getting enough oxygen, the compensatory mechanism of the heart will be to increase cardiac output. And what's the first thing the heart does to increase cardiac output? It increases rate. So we look at the vital signs to give us clues about what's going on with the patient's respiratory status. If they're getting better, the respiratory rate should come into a normal range. Their SATs should be, should be above 90 to 92. The standard, most of the doctors want their patients to be above 92% on their saturation. If it's a COPD patient, they'll let them go as low as 90. When they get into the 80s, we're not usually happy with that at all, even in a COPD patient. However, there are some of them that live in that range. We look at arterial blood gases. You may or may not have those available to you in clinical. They may have done one on admission on your respiratory patients. If we're in ICU and the patient's on a ventilator, they do ABGs at least once a day, sometimes more. So I'm used to seeing them a lot, but you won't always see those on the floor as much. They give us a lot more specific information. They give us information about the patient's pH, what's going on with their CO2, what's going on with their bicarb, and what's going on with their PaO2, which is, generally speaking, a better measure of oxygenation than a saturation. Okay, so if you have ABGs, they're very telling. They're very telling about what's going on with patients. All right, assessment abnormalities. When we assess the lungs, we are again looking for symmetry. Remember we talked about that with neuro? We're looking for chest expansion symmetry. We're looking for symmetry and shape. What about the diameter of the chest? Okay, it's kind of wider this way than it is anterior posteriorly. It's wider this way. What if 
the patient has an increased AP diameter. That's considered a barrel chest or a rounded chest and that's not normal in humans. That would be suggestive of something called emphysema, right? Where we have the chest enlarged compensatorily. And they, emphysema patients have a lot of dead space. When you listen to the lungs of a patient with emphysema, you don't hear hardly anything at all. Why? Because they have old underwear for lungs. They do. The air goes in there and it's just sort of trapped in there. There's not a lot of recoil, it just kind of sits in there. So you hear very little. Even though it looks like they're breathing a lot, you hear very little, very decreased breath sounds. All right, so we're also listening. You should start to think about what patients you're taking care of and before you assess them, what do you think that you're going to find? If you have a patient with a right lower lobe pneumonia, what do you expect you're going to hear when you listen over that right lower lobe? Nothing. Crackles, nothing, you might, it, wheezing. You would expect you're going to hear either nothing or some noises. Which is better, nothing or noises? Noises, noises is better. If you have nothing and then you get noises, you've, you've made an improvement for the day. If you've had noises and you go to nothing, that's worse. That means it's more full with fluid, it's more swollen, and there's not gas exchange at all. Okay? So you want to start anticipating what it is that you will hear or see in assessment in relationship to the pathophysiology for the patient. We talked about VQ scans, that's a diagnostic study. We do a lot of uh, chest x-rays, CAT scans, um, to try to work up what's going on uh, physiologically for patients in uh, the pulmonary system. But just suffice it to say that if you don't have good lungs, you're, you're not going to be able to do much. It uh, really changes the lifestyle for patients. Concerns with our elderly patients, they have less cough reflex. So when you're going to suction them, they're not going to uh, as much as we do when you hit the carina. We're going to be good at it. They're going to be a little bit, you know, not as much. Elastic recoil, their underwear is getting older. It's getting older. Uh, how many functional alveoli? The units, the functional units decrease in number with aging. The immune system function decreases. Their alveolar macrophages are not going to be as aware and alert and vigilant looking for bacterial invaders. That makes our elderly population more at risk for acquired pneumonias, community acquired pneumonias and nosocomial pneumonias when they're in the hospital. And their response to hypoxia, meaning not enough oxygen, and hypercapnia, meaning too much CO2, is not as wonderful as it should be. And we certainly know that uh, a large population, a large par part of our elderly population starts to have lung problems. We're going to talk about COPD later and what happens with the drive to breathe because that actually adaptively changes in patients with COPD. So their general ability to, response to not a, respond to not enough oxygen or elevated CO2 declines with age. All right, now we're going to start talking about the different disease processes and I'm going to lift my screen up just a little bit so I can draw on the board for you. I really recommend that you draw these silly little diagrams of what's going on physiologically and it will help you understand what it is that you're dealing with in the lungs. Okay, so I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna put my screen up just a little bit and we're gonna fill the board all the way across here with pictures of different disease processes and people tell me that helps them as much as talking about it. All right, so pronunciation of this word, atelectasis. Say it, atelectasis. atelectasis. Uh, was working Sunday. No, this was two Sundays ago, take that back. Two Sundays ago, and one of the nurses went to the pulmonologist and said, you know, your patient has atelectasis. And the doctor looked at me, what did she just say? What did she just say? What is she trying to tell me? And in, it, in the same breath, he was, she was telling him that the, the patient had, uh, what did she, how did she pronounce it? Anascara. The patient had anasarca and atelectasis. And the doctor right away had no faith in that nurse because she pronounced those two words very incorrectly. Do you know what I'm saying? So anasarca is full body edema. 
Anasarca, not Anascara. And atelectasis is a partial collapse of the lung, lung, not atelectasis. So we'll try to impart some of those pronunciations to you so that you don't get in trouble. Because right after he heard her say those two words, he would only talk to me. And that's sad, right? That's sad because she'd been the nurse all night long. She knew the patient better than I did. But pulmonologist, pulmonary words, so say atelectasis. Okay, so we're going to draw the, the chest cavity here. That's the chest cavity. And we're going to put the lungs in it. Here's the trachea coming down. There's one lung. And here's the other lung. When you have atelectasis, part of the lung collapses or part of the lung is not expanded. And that's called atelectasis. This happens very frequently with patients after surgery. It is a common complication postoperatively because when you're under general anesthesia, guess what? You don't take deep breaths. I want to be sure I spell it right. Did I spell it right? Okay. Other things that can cause this are pain medications or immobility. If, if I laid you in bed for the whole Thanksgiving vacation and gave you lots of nice pain medicine and you'd be all happy, even though you're healthy, you could still get atelectasis and you could get it on both sides of your lungs. So how common do you think it is in our elderly patients who undergo surgery, end up getting pain medicine postoperatively, who have old underwear lungs? It's very common. So what is it that we do to prevent atelectasis post-op? We have the patient do incentive spirometer, cough, deep, breathe. And if they won't use the incentive spirometer, this is what you do. You just tell them to take a deep breath and hold it for 10 seconds. There are some patients you can just never teach them how to do it. It's like, okay, be a human vacuum cleaner. <laughs> You know, suck it all in and hold it. They still don't get it. Or maybe they're just so weak that they can't do it. But most of them can understand that it's exactly the same action to have somebody take a deep breath and hold it to the count of 10. That's what we did before we had those fancy machines because I was around before we had those fancy machines that everybody has sitting on their bedside table and nobody uses. Right? So before incentive spirometry, we had our patients take a deep breath and hold it to the count of 10. And then you get the same response usually. The patient will cough. They'll take a deep breath and they'll cough. So that if there's phlegm there, it moves it, gets the air underneath of that and helps re-expand the lungs. What we see on the chest film, as you notice right here, is pretty profound. This is the diaphragm here, all right? That's the diaphragm. So this lung is expanded all the way down. Look at where the base of this lung is. So this lower lobe is basically all what? Collapsed. There's no oxygenation happening in this whole period, this whole area right there. If you were to assess that patient and listen over that area, what would you hear? Nothing. That is correct. So sometimes we're not sure why there is a nothing sound. It could be atelectasis. It could be that they had that lower lobe of their lung cut out. It could be lots of things that we're going to continue to talk about. But the fact that there is no sound there is significant. We need to understand what that is. And if possible, make it better. If possible. It's not always going to be possible. So turn, cough, deep breathe. Get them up and move them. Remember that when you're on a ventilator or you're in surgery, the thing that doesn't happen is you don't do what's called a sigh. All of you periodically will take a deep breath. <gasps> Sometimes that's because you're irritated with me because I'm saying something that's too fast or you, you know. <gasps> well, physiologically, that's a very good thing for you because it expands your lungs a little bit more and forcefully than you normally would. When we put a patient on a ventilator, they don't do that. When we give them general anesthesia, they don't do that. They just breathe at the same volume in and out the whole time we have them sedated. Unless we push the button and give them a manual sigh. <gasps> we can program one in. 
That's part of the reason why patients get atelectasis. Okay, so that's picture number one is atelectasis. Okay, picture number two. Sorry, these words are longer on this one. Let's do the words first. And No, I want to do the picture first. Let's do the picture first. I know this is like laborious for you, but you'll get it. Okay, with pneumonia, we have inflammation inside the lungs. So, let's put one up here. This could be bacteria related, this could be viral related, or this could be aspiration related, especially because it's in one of the upper lobes. I always want you to think aspiration if it's in the upper lobes. This is inside the lungs, not outside the lungs. It's happening inside. When you have something inflamed because there's bacteria, virus, or chemical irritation, it weeps. It makes an exudate. That is part of the problem. The exudate then becomes a medium for more bacterial growth. Generally speaking, if you have a viral pneumonia, it is quite dry. You will cough and be inflamed, but you won't have a lot of sputum. Generally speaking, if you have a bacterial pneumonia, you are going to hack up some really nasty phlegm, yellow, green, or rusty. That will help you as far as taking care of your patients with pneumonia. The other thing is, remember before we start antibiotics on our pneumonia patients, we should be sending a sputum to the lab to be able to isolate what's going on. Sometimes the sputums will come back normal, but the patient still has pneumonia. What kind of pneumonia then do they have? Viral. viral. When you look at your CBC on a viral pneumonia, guess which of the white blood cells becomes elevated? Lymphocytes. Lymphocytes. Exactly correct. So you have data that will be present to help you zero in on what type of problem your patient has. Now if they start out with viral, a lot of times they'll get a bacterial one on top of it. So there are some patients that come in with viral and end up with bacterial also. Okay, so that could be in any area. When you're listening over that area where the pneumonia is, what will you hear? You might hear nothing. You might hear crackles or wheezing. You would expect to be hearing something different than a normal lung sound over an area that has pneumonia. Okay, so let's make sure we cover everything on this slide. Acute inflammation of the lung caused by a microbial agent or aspiration. It's not nice when stomach contents pH of 2 end up in the lungs. This causes a lot of irritation, inflammation, and exudate formation. And usually then they get a secondary bacterial on top of that. All right, so it could be any of those things. How do we diagnose it? Chest x-ray. We want to collect some of their sputum so that we can identify the organism. And then patient care, hopefully it makes sense to you that we're going to give them oxygen support if needed. Anti-infectives will increase fluid as long as they're not a patient with congestive heart failure or renal problems. We'll give them, uh, this helps get the phlegm out by the way, liquefies the secretions. We'll give them pain medication so it's easier for them to cough as long as we're not putting them to sleep so that they don't breathe at all and resting and small uh, frequent meals, right? Getting them up and moving them around as soon as possible is also helpful. Putting a pneumonia patient in bed for a week doesn't usually make them better. If they're really bad off, they end up with me in critical care and we have to put a tube down and suction them out for several days and give them antibiotics and rest. And then hopefully we can get them off the ventilator in a day or two. All right, let's talk about tuberculosis for a few minutes. This is a disease process which likes to hang out in the lungs. The TB germ, the bacteria, I was arguing with somebody yesterday about whether tuberculosis was a virus or a bacteria. I'm like, it's a bacteria. It is. No, it's a virus. No, it isn't. No, it isn't. It's a bacteria. So the thing about this bacteria is that you don't get rid of it. The best your body can do with it is wall it off. So once you uh, contract tuberculosis, 
you you have it you have it you might not be active with it but you have infection that makes sense it likes to hang out in the lungs too it likes highly oxygenated areas but you can get tuberculosis in your joints and in your organs it's not real common but there are patients sometimes that come in with tuberculosis lesions in their spine in their joints or in organs it is possible again the best the immune system can do with tuberculosis is wall it off it can't ever completely eradicate it All right so let's talk to, about the difference between infection and active disease and to let you know first of all it's not easy to get TB you got to really work at it it's true now if you have HIV it's very easy to get TB because your immune system is suppressed I've taken care of several active patients I've never converted the people that get TB usually have frequent contact over lots of time so like if you live in a prison or close living quarters with people that have active disease and they cough in your face every night for two months you're probably going to get it for me taking care of active patients a day or two before they get diagnosed and put on isolations I, I have never contracted I've been called many times and said you you got to go through the studies you had an active patient that you cared for I've not zero converted yet it is why they're more cautious about isolating patients who are hacking up about a lot of rusty sputum there's a good chance they might be TB positive or if they're from another country okay alright so infection means they have the germ inside of them an infection means that you're going to test positive for a TB skin test for the rest of your life. It doesn't mean that you have active. The way they find active disease is by doing a chest film. Do you have active lesions? Are you experiencing fever, night sweats, and all of the symptoms that go along with active TB? So, the other people that test positive for TB skin test are people who've had the vaccine guess what we don't give the vaccine in our country I have students argue with me in class there is no vaccine for TB I'm like yes there is in most other countries people are vaccinated for TB they get the BCG it's on their shot record we just don't do it in this country why because TB doesn't kill people our government doesn't pay for it because we don't have a big health, a public health issue with tuberculosis it's hard to get it it's really hard to get it so we don't pay to vaccinate everybody but I can guarantee you there are people in this class right now that have a positive TB skin test because they've been vaccinated and guess what they're not sick and they and they don't have active disease but there's a lot of doctors who think they do and make them go on INH I had one student who told me this long story they put me on INH and they told me I had TB I showed him my shot record I'm like oh my gosh now that's ignorant that is really ignorant when you've had a person who's had the vaccine they're going to be positive for the rest of their life they've had the vaccine they don't need drugs okay whatever but my physician my physician said I'm like she said I knew they were wrong I said why don't you go to a different physician <laughs> it's really hard to get sputum to show positive for TB too it's difficult so they'll do several studies of the sputum in order to say that somebody's clear or not infected don't be surprised how do you know your TB skin test is positive what if you got a big red spot it's 10 millimeters and the key word bumped up in duration it must have in duration now this, the two-step test which we now have to take yes I had to take it too. I had to do it again, right? Because potentially I had TB a long, long, long time ago. That's why how I understand this. Yeah, why are and you? I, and I would test negative the first exposure to the PPD, but then because now I've been exposed recently, the second test. It would be there are some people. There's three there are some people who are subclinical, and we don't pick it up on the first test. So it's like they give the antigen, and then within one to three weeks you get like a booster of the antigen. So for those people that are only mildly show or wouldn't show that go underneath the wire, it pops them up as positive on the second test. Don't they have some in duration the first time? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. So all of you in your career will get to enjoy doing the two step and you shouldn't have to do it again like that. I keep my copies of my first and second one 
so that I don't have to do it again. They should call it the four step. I know. Because they should call it a way to earn money. Step, right? right? Scott, go back and look. That's two steps. <laughs> There are some people that will show up positive on the second one just because their antibody level is not quite high enough or immunologically it hasn't shown high enough of a titer to show up on the, yeah. <coughs> Two steps are in our life now. So you'll have to do it once for the program. Keep that so that when you're employed you don't have to do it again. Is the chest x-ray a better test? Than yes, for, if they're worried you know about people that have been vaccinated and they can't prove it or whatever or if somebody tests positive those people just get a chest film every day showing they have no active lesions which means they're not communicable they're not having any of the signs and symptoms they have to fill out a piece of paper that says they're not coughing they don't have fevers they don't have night sweats they don't have rusty sputum they do their chest film every year and that's good for them No, you shouldn't. People who've been vaccinated should never have a TB skin test. This is going to make a huge, unless they want to demonstrate for the rest of the class what a positive TB skin test looks like. They should have one. They've produced antibodies because they've been inoculated with the antigen. Just so you know that. Apparently a lot of our physicians don't know that. Is that scary or what? This poor student who told me she had to be on INH for six to eight months. No, six to nine months as profi for TB. Mary, I told him I had the vaccine. I said, I'm so sorry to hear that because that puts her at extra risk for liver damage. I recently had my TB done. You can still see the scar. <laughs> um, Linda looked at it, said it was positive. I went in. They said no. It's not positive. They're going to feel was, it. They don't hardly even look at it. Yeah. They take their finger and they go like that. She did. Linda, you could feel it. Everybody in our clinical group felt it. It was a big welt. Well, I don't know why they um, said it was or wasn't. but They said because it wasn't like hard as a rock, like a pebble was in it, and that um, the person that gave it didn't get a will. So they gave it too deep, so it was just irritating. I wouldn't be able to comment on that. I would just say that as long as you don't have signs and symptoms of active disease, see what you get next year. Yeah. Every year it gets worse, that little. Well, thing. you may have had a mild exposure. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Okay. I'll tell you what, though. If you're on prednisone or steroids, guess what? That can give you a false negative. No, a false negative. They don't want to test you if you're on steroids. That can affect things. All right, so we just talked about this a little bit, so you've had some exposure to what's going on. This shows you an active lesion, some active lesions. This is what they're looking for. So when they do the chest film, that's what they're looking for. And if you listen to them, it would be much like assessing someone with pneumonia, right? Because the best the body can do is wall off a tuberculosis lesion. It can't get rid of it. The best it can do is, is wall it off. There are, other, there are a few other bacteria that are like that in that same class of acid fast bacillus. I think nocardia is another one. The body can't really get rid of them, it just kind of walls it off. All right, signs and symptoms. These are the things that you would look for. You know, if you have active disease, you're going to have some of those symptoms. And the drug therapy is complex. Most patients are going to be on more than one agent. The first one they use is INH. INH is the, uh, the profi, the preventative one. If someone in your family is active and you live with them, they'll put you on INH prophylactically. And then they'll put you on, if you're active, they'll probably put you on uh, one or two other agents. Major side effect, liver. If you're going to get a question on state board about tuberculosis drugs, it's probably going to be related to liver side effects. And you want to have a really good job working for the public health department? You can go do direct observed therapy. When patients are active with TB, they got to take their medicine every day. And there's some public health nurses out there that go visit active TB patients and watch them swallow their pills every day. Why? Because it's a communicable disease and there's concern about spread. There's people that just go watch people take medicine every day. So they were active and looking It wouldn't be a bad idea, would it? Would they be at risk of contracting it? more so than the average Joe. But remember, TB, if you cough it out and it lands on the surface right here, it dies. It's not virulent. The way TB goes is it's got to get from the other person directly into you and take up habitation. It's not easy to get it. Ha, 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 coughing, days and days and days. 
Yeah, face to face with a partner, you know, in tight quarters. It's not easy to get it. I would have already had it. I've had several exposures. I would have already had it if it was easy to get. Yes. Yes, because they create a pneumonia type situation. And she's talking about coccidiomycosis. Coxy? Valley fever. It's the agent which causes valley fever. Very prevalent in our area. It's in our dirt. It's in our dirt. So people that travel, uh, we see it a lot in truck drivers that drive through dusty areas and dust storms. We see it um, in immunosuppressed people who are out cleaning out their backyards or their garages and there's a lot of dirt kicked up and they end up with valley fever. It kind of looks like uh, yellowish greenish broccoli on a bronch. It's really interesting. It has like a color to it. So if they bronch a patient therapeutically, bronch meaning they go down and they look, they can take a biopsy or they can uh, clean them out, you know, flush them and suck out at the same time to open up their airways. Uh, it has an interesting characteristic and causes interesting lesions on the chest film as well. Looks like little BBs. If you look at a chest film and there's all little spots that look like BBs, it's probably coccidiomycosis or valley fever. And remember, we see this in our HIV patients. Most of us should easily be able to fight off valley fever, coccidiomycosis. It should not be a problem. Our immune system should have no difficulty fighting it off. It's people who are immunocompromised that end up with it. They're, they're not sleeping, they're not eating well, they're working long hours, or they have other issues. Okay? 